excited to be back taking you through um, some of my journey and some of the work that I do um, as a woman in tech. Um, so let's let's get started. Um, and I want to give you a bit of a question to think about in the beginning. Um, how do you want to save the world? Is that a question you've ever asked yourself? Is that a question you may already have an answer to? Um, and is it a question that you answer with your personal life or with your job, maybe? Um, and can your can your job save the world to some extent, at least? It's a pretty big question. So give it some thought. Um, and I will guide you today through a bit of my answer uh, to this question and also some encouragement um, on how this might be you know, inspiring to others, but also hoping for, for some exchange on that. And, and then excited to maybe also get to know some of you and their answer to this question. So I'm Janine Bauer. I am uh, um, joined Salonis basically six years ago, more than six years ago. Um, and at that time, Salonis was still in the startup phase and then in the last years has grown tremendously. And we will talk about that slightly um, a bit later. But I have the pleasure to really go through a journey from you know starting in an educational program, which was called Academic Alliance and building that up and then building that out towards a more of an ESG program um, based on those strong educational values um, and then an additional core value of sustainability at Salonis. And in the past six years, I've seen tremendous growth from the company, from the people around me, um, from our customers, the products we have. Um, and it's a great honor to lead the sustainability strategy now for this company. I've had different experiences also in different industries and, and different sized companies. And I can say that the tech world is surely the most inspiring to me. It's I feel the world where like most of the things happen um, and where you just get like new opportunities every day. It's never boring and you can really find answers to great questions of our times. Um, and to give you a bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about um, in, in the next uh, couple of minutes is um, led by the strategy and the work that I do at Salonis and the company. So our sustainability strategy is quite exciting because it's two-folded. Um, we do have a core value that is called Earth is our future, and that's really the key to it. And then we do our homework, as we call it. So we want to become a better company by driving really a sustainable culture and operations. And that means that we do track our carbon footprint, we embarked on a net zero journey. We focus on diversity and inclusion. And we're also focusing on doing the right things from a compliance and ethical governance perspective. And because we're a data-driven company, we also measure our own sustainability performance. And at the same time, as a tech company, we know that our greatest good is also our people. And so we focus on providing them with platform to really foster a sustainability minded culture and empower them to drive impact in their communities. So that is what I would see you would see in many tech companies as a sustainability strategy. And we have given it a second side to it, which is the offering that we can have. And you will see in a bit how our technology works in a product and how this can provide solutions to some of the great questions and challenges of our time. So we want to enable really sustainable business performance and help our customers become more sustainable. And that is basically led um, by the big challenge that everyone these days needs a comprehensive sustainability strategy to face the demands that we see from regulations. And we have um, established and, and worked towards building that out a lot more, a AI-driven sustainability layer that helps our customers achieve their sustainability targets fast and in high quality. So that is the second part to that. And that means also I lead a team of like very different people with very different skill sets and mindsets, whether they are in product and go to market or working on Salonis transformation. And that's quite an exciting day to day job, to be honest. So let's start with a bit of an introduction to our technology. Every process step you take, um, we look into then what this means for Salonis as a company overall. And in the end, I'll share some thoughts for you on like what I've learned um, on my journey as like a woman in tech and also a woman leading and building a department in a tech company. So let's get going. Um, now you've heard a lot about processes already, and Ellie has like you know, kind of framed the problem already in the beginning. What is process intelligence? Um, and I want to give you a number to start with, um, and that is something you might definitely know from like your day to day job, which is that many companies do have a lot of different applications to do their work in their organization. Most of the companies actually have ten or more um, applications to execute a business process. 
And what is the business process? It might be a procurement process. So how you decide on what supplier you pick and then how you purchase your goods and services. Then it can go into a logistics process of kind of like how you ship things from A to B. It can be a production process. It can be a sales process where you use Salesforce to track your different leads. And it can get into something like how you bring your goods to your customers. So really every business out there has a multitude of business processes. And most of the times they do those processes and execute on them with multiple applications. And that itself isn't a problem because, you know, there's a lot of great applications out there. Now with AI, there's a few more that make our life much easier. The problem is when you really ask the companies, do they know how their processes operate and what's really going on in their organization? And if you ask a couple of executives and leaders here, they really don't have a level of visibility into their processes. So only 16% of leaders say that they really understand how their company runs and like what the processes are like, but most of them have only moderate visibility. And that's a great problem because that means you don't really know how things are going in your organization. And that means there is inefficiencies and all kinds of problems. There's waste in your processes. There can be additional emissions. And there's also, um, it's very hard to achieve customer satisfaction with that as well because they might not get the goods on time, just as a simple example. And how this looks like in reality, if you like ask that question, can be shown with a picture like this. And I love to, to, to show this. Um, And that's really coming down to the problem. Processes are super hard to see and therefore even harder to improve. So in most of the cases, the process was designed like something you see on the left side. Like if I ask anyone in your organization, how do you think we do this certain process? Then everyone would probably be able to chart down a couple of activities and also maybe come up with a couple of like timestamps and bring it in the right order and say like, this is how we usually do procurement, for example. But everyone also knows that there's not always one simple way of like doing processes. So many organizations already know that there is sub deviations or like different variants on like how to do things. Like sometimes we change a price and it's totally normal. Like there is not that one way to do it. So most of the businesses think their process looks like the picture in the middle and there's, you know, some additional activities, but still pretty streamlined. But what happens if you apply process mining technology to your process and actually use the data from your IT system, um, extract that, and then transform it into a process visualization using the algorithm, you get the picture on the right. Um, And that's how processes actually run and how complex it is. And that means departments have a really hard time to work together. We sense that as employees, our customers sense that, our supplier can sense that. And it's also really, really bad for the environment and the planet. And so this is... um, This is already a challenge for most of the businesses, but it really becomes a challenge if we think about it from a sustainability perspective. Everyone has probably heard that there's like a lot more global regulations coming from a sustainability standpoint, and it requires really companies to have a very comprehensive sustainability strategy that is looking at your suppliers, your carbon footprint, um, your employee satisfaction, um, the waste you have in your organizations. And I love this world map because it really shows how many global regulations in a sustainability space we have or that are currently invented. And yes, the EU is up front, but to be honest, there is like global regulations. And so it affects every company out there, whether it's like super small or super big. And that is something that companies now have to tackle and they do. They set sustainability targets um, and they come up with like good sustainability strategies, but they still have a really hard time to transform their business um, into a sustainable company. And why is that? The typical approaches for how companies manage their sustainability transformation is very time consuming, very manual. Data is scattered all over the place, siloed. The business is not really bought in. And most of the time, it's very retrospective and you have limited insights. So it's not actionable. You can't really achieve your targets and you can't make progress. And so what we're working on is shifting that approach into something that is more core to your business, more process driven. Also using AI, um, because we have to be innovative, it is much faster and continuous um, and is more business continued. There can be simulation and optimization and real time. So we need to be able to really put a finger on the pulse of our company and be like, can this company be sustainable? And then, yes, what do we have to do? And how this looks like um, in practice is that there's already a lot of companies out there who are starting to shift towards this process-driven approach for sustainability in various ways, whether they're thinking about more efficient sustainability reporting 
or engaging their suppliers at scale of really reducing emissions and cost. And you see a couple of logos out there, but there's like a couple of more also in the background. And we're just excited to get more companies on board and work with them on either reducing their emissions um, or increasing the sustainable spend or driving sustainability reporting in a good way. And how this looks like from a tech stack perspective, and I'm not spending too much time on this, but just to show you this, is that we start with um, a lot of different data sources. And our goal is to harmonize them all in one platform. And so you can use whatever data source you have in your organization from your ERP system to your data platforms, but now also emissions data or ESG data from like Ecovadis, for example. And you bring all of that to your business op operations and your processes. So you see your standardized process data, but also process knowledge. You can use AI there and you can really understand how your company runs. And now we add a layer on top, which is the intelligent sustainability layer for reporting, target setting and emissions reduction in various areas. There is a strong focus on the supply chain right now because this is mission critical for sustainability. Um, and there is a couple of, of use cases and applications in that area, but also corporate sustainability around carbon accounting or the product carbon footprint. So a lot of different use cases are possible if you think about, you know, harmonizing all the data you need for that and then just, you know, adding very intelligent data applications on top of that. And that is what we do for our customers. Obviously, you can't just, you know, sell something or build something, even if you're like most passionate about that, this will be the biggest scale and can, you know, really help bigger organizations saving the world. You also need to ensure that your footprint is covered and that like as a company, you've done your homework. So at Salonis, which is a company that was started in 2011 and is now from a like you know, process mining technology perspective and is now transitioning into a platform company around process intelligence. We've been working with like a lot of large organizations and multiple customers in all areas of the world with about 3000 employees now. We're still considered a like rather small company from an employee and carbon footprint perspective, but we're working with the large organizations and we really have to be sure that we're a responsible supplier and also provide a future proof company to our employees. So how are we doing that? Um, if we look at sustainability at Salonis, um, we have quite a clear governance structure. So my team reports to the chief legal and trust officer, and then we have a team that acts a bit like a center of excellence. So we have a dedicated go-to-market team, dedicated product team, dedicated transformation team, and that team is focusing on various areas within sustainability. And that can range really from climate to social impact to governance. We have set clear goals for our team and we also focus on a couple of levers that just work better in a technology company. And I'm speaking about that in a second. We have really measures um, around like specific drivers that we can have when it comes to our carbon footprint, like mobility or procurement. And we have clear KPIs that we track and also report on. And all of the work from this team is supported really by a sustainable culture and a strong sustainability community, um, but also trainings and something that we call Global Impact Days. And the next one is quite soon in May, so I'm already excited. And that is a day where everyone in the organization really gets a day blocked to focus on meaningful work in the communities or for our customers within sustainability or our company. Um, and so this is where we also bring our purpose as a company really to life. And a few learnings that I wanted to share with you from that sustainability journey so far, and it's still a journey, so there's probably a lot more learnings along the way, but some of the things that I've seen in the past four years is really, first of all, start with your values as an organization. So for us, it was key that we integrated Earth is our future as one of our core values, and you see the others down below in the, in the picture. Um, and that has really helped significantly to drive the awareness across the organization and always have something to check back on, being like, hey, um, you know, sustainability is really important for us because look at the value and it drives decisions and action and strategies across the teams, not just my team. The second important piece is that because we're um, a very fast growing company with a very young work base, um, engagement is really key. So we can obviously, you know, drive all strategic measures really by like, what's the outcome? For example, on a carbon footprint, let's reduce it and like kind of like, you know, let's drive the hard things. But if you don't have engagement across your organization, you don't have acceptance and also people don't you know, support you on it. They, they might even fight back. And so whenever we decide on like strategic directions and measures, we also make that based on the impact it has on, on the KPI, like the footprint, but then also engagement for our employees. And lastly, community is really key. Like 
giving your people and your employees the possibility and time to drive their own projects. That is such a great sense for like team spirit, ownership and accountability. So the impact days have been, I think, the most successful project that we have been driving internally for the company itself. And so as a closing uh, statement, I wanted to give you a couple of personal thoughts, like what has helped me personally on that journey of really building and, and leading a team in a tech company as a woman. Um, and you can be the only or first um, kind of statement. So I would describe my success formula really as a combination of like follow your values, like something that is really, really important for you and that is non-negotiable. Then add your strength, so the things that you're really good at, and find a job where you have many activities that follow your strength, because that will give you ultimate reward, it will give you recognition, and it also feels like much easier to work in that. You will need endurance, so I will say that it's not always been easy, and yes, there is things that you don't get as a woman first, but you can ask for it and you can fight for it, and if you endure it, then there will be success. And then timing. It's also very important to understand when an opportunity is just too good to be true, or you have to maybe say yes a bit earlier because an opportunity unfolds it, and you have to make sure that you just you know meet the timing perspective as well. Um, and then there's like really four learnings I had. First one is courage. That's like my favorite statement. And some people might recognize the movie it's taken from, but courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the conscious decision that something else is more important than fear. And I think that is, especially as a woman in tech, quite crucial to not be afraid um, to take the step. You can be afraid, but you can decide that, you know, this is something that really follows your values and strength so much more that, you know, you can have the fear, but you still do it. Um, second is like aligned with the strength, communication and presence. There is, I've seen a lot of amazing women and you will see more on stage during this conference that are really, really good at like presenting and communicating. And that's something that you can really own it. So think about how can you train that, your presence, your communication skills, and also say yes, if you get a moment on stage, because you're first of all, might not you know get that easily and second is you will be a role model for so many others so never be afraid even if someone says like oh we need you because you're a woman yeah i know this is annoying but still do it because otherwise a man might do the moment on stage and you don't want that to just you know be a bit clearer here um and then there is an important thing make friends not enemies so find and nourish really a group of ideally female peers but also male peers that weathers the storms with you and celebrates the successes i call this my board of directors because it really is and it can be internally like your colleagues and it can also be friends outside and lastly sustain your performance so you're always only as good as your brain and body allow so really prioritize your health also your mental health, notice if there's any dangerous thoughts or patterns and also get help if you need it and really ask for it and prioritize self-care rigorously because no job in the world, even like the greatest leadership opportunity is worth it if you destroy yourself through it. So I'll, I'm very frank and honest about that because I do think it's like especially important as women. But, you know, if you master these things, you can, you know, achieve great success and you can really change the world. And so I am... I'm very excited to hear some questions or comments um, if we still have time, but want to thank you. and just excited. If you want to reach out, just do that. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn um, or text me. And um, yeah, it was such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.